Ephesians 2, 11 through 18, and the King James text today reads, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access, that is, Jew and Gentile, we both have access by one Spirit, Unto the Father. Amen. Master, we live at a time in human history when technology has placed a camera in the hands of virtually every human being on the planet almost. No matter where you go, it seems that rich and poor are all equipped with camera phones. This technology has also given birth to another phenomenon, it's one that we call the selfie. You'll notice by my sermon illustration behind my head today, there's a young man taking a selfie of himself with Queen Elizabeth in the background. He wants to be able to show people, he wants to be able to brag, I suppose, that he was in the company of, or he had an opportunity to see the Queen of England in the flesh. He didn't. He had just read about her. He had just seen pictures of her. But rather he has had the opportunity to see her in the flesh. While I was living in New York City during the decade of the 90s, I lived there uh, basically the entire decade of the 1990s. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to meet a number of celebrities. Yes, I can honestly say that there are some very famous people, well-known people, that I have seen and spoken to in the flesh. I had the opportunity to have a wonderful visit with the marvelous actor uh, Hume Cronin. You may remember him as the uh, widower of Jessica Tandy, the incredible actress Jessica Tandy, and Hume Cronin and I were on a train together going from New York City into Connecticut. He sat directly behind me. I didn't want to uh, interrupt him too much, but I could not resist talking to him for a minute. And he was reading a newspaper, and I said, Sir, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but you are Hume Cronin, aren't you? He said, Yes, I am. And uh, I said, oh, I, I, I love your work. I, I love everything you've ever done. Of course, he's been an actor going back to the 
40s, you know. He's been in many of the old black and white films, and you know. And I said, and my, I loved your wife. I said, what a wonderful, talented, incredible woman she was. And he began, rose immediately to fold his paper up. He closed his paper, and he began to fold it up on his lap. And he just started talking to me like we were old friends. And I'm going to tell you, you never saw a man that loved his wife as much as Hume Cronin did. He just talked about her more than he did himself and bragged on her and her skills and her abilities and her talent. But I can honestly say that I met Hume Cronin in the flesh. Had the opportunity to meet Matthew Broderick on a street in New York City. I was walking, and as I often do, Tommy can tell you, I wasn't paying attention. Probably looking at some baby or something and, you know, talking to baby. I love myself some babies. I did this yesterday. I was walking somewhere, and I'm looking. Oh, we were at the mall, and I was looking at a baby and talking to me, and I kind of bumped arms with this black gentleman and he kind of turned around and I could tell he's a little aggravated and I said I'm so sorry and immediately he melted and said oh it's okay you know he just want to make sure I wasn't one of them rude buggers like so many you know but I was just distracted well with Matthew Broderick I was distracted walking down West 4th Street wasn't paying attention all of a sudden I bumped into a man and knocked him right on his rear end and I looked and I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I'm trying to help him up. And he was putting his sunglasses back on. And he was looking at me like he's half terrified. I thought, well, good Lord, I just accidentally knocked you over. It's not like I'm trying to kidnap you or I'm trying to uh, take your wallet or anything. And I helped him up. And he began to walk away. And I was saying, my goodness, he looked familiar to me. Where do I know that guy from? Because sometimes I'm terrible at remembering stuff, you know. And then all of a sudden, on to me, I said, oh my goodness, that was Matthew Broderick. <clears throat> so I've seen Matthew Broderick. And as a matter of fact, I've had an encounter with him in the flesh. I had the opportunity to meet Nathan Lane of the Birdcage fame. You might remember him from the Birdcage. I love Nathan Lane. My goodness, I think he's one of the funniest actors I've ever seen in my life. He cracks me up. He can do things with his faces. If you ever look at his face, I swear that man has muscles in his face that nobody else on the planet has. Because he can do things with his eyebrows and you know he can make his face contort in so many different ways. And I love him, and I ran into him many years ago. Oh, now somebody going to judge me in a nightclub. <laughs> and I literally came face to face with him, kind of bumped into him, and I saw who it was. I reached out. I gave him the biggest hug. I said, oh, I, said, I love you. I think you're wonderful. I love your work. And, of course, again, he looked like he had just been hugged by King Kong and ran off, you know. Later, I met another actor who was a friend of Nathan Lane's. I don't think I put his name down here. Uh, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was one of those who did a voice in uh, The Lion King. He played the, I believe it was the Warthog in The Lion King. And uh, I met him at a restaurant one day, and he and I spoke at length, had a wonderful conversation. And I told him how I had bumped into Nathan Lane. And uh, I said, poor Nathan, I'd give him a big hug. I said, I think I scared him to death because he about ran away from me. And this gentleman said, well, I'm surprised. He said, you're just his type. <laughs> so I've met Nathan Lane in the flesh. Kathy Najimi of Sister Act fame, met her in the flesh. Susan Sarandon, I've met her in the flesh, held the door for her on about two or three different occasions at various stores throughout New York City. Queen Latifah, held the door for Queen Latifah, but I didn't know at the time it was Queen Latifah. The owner of the store told me after this young lady walked out, because she was all dressed, you know, kind of floppy-headed, and uh, or uh, not a floppy head, but a uh, like a winter cap, you know, and she had on stuff, and you couldn't really tell who she was. You know, people of renown tend to have to kind of... Uh, 
hide themselves or else they'll be flooded with uh, fans. And uh, the man said, do you know who you just held the door for? I said, no. He said, that's Queen Latifah said uh, she's from this neighborhood and I was working in real estate at the time and I was showing a property in that area. He said she's from this neighborhood and she comes in here every time she's in town. I met uh, Danny Benaducci from the Partridge family and uh, I want to tell you, I got to tell you, one of the nicest, sweetest guys I've ever met in my life. He actually twice I had an opportunity, not just to meet him in passing, but to actually sit and have a, a pretty decent conversation with him. And he's had a lot of issues in his life. He's had trouble with drugs and alcohol. He's had trouble in his marriage and all this. But he lived for a number of years with his wife and daughter in the West Village which is affectionately known in New York City as the Gaberhood. And he lived right there in the heart of the Gaberhood. And I'm going to tell you, Danny, I, it, I wished he'd watched this video so I could tell him. He had the sweetest spirit of one of, uh, of, of anybody I've ever met in my life, believe it or not. Danny Benaducci had a marvelous attitude, a marvelous spirit. Very kind person, you know, very friendly, very outgoing, and I really enjoyed meeting him in the flesh. Gavin McLeod, you may remember him as the captain of the love boat. The bald-headed Gavin McLeod had the opportunity to meet Gavin McLeod in the flesh. One of my favorite musicals of all time, one of my favorite plays of all time, is the story Mame. You may remember Mame if you've ever seen the movie. Uh, well, the musical version starred Lucille Ball, and uh, it also starred uh, Beatrice Arthur. Well, the same day that I met Gavin McLeod, I also met Jane Connell, who played Agnes Gooch in the musical version, and I loved her. Oh, I thought she did such a marvelous job, because that's one of my favorite plays of all time. And I thought she had done such a marvelous job playing Agnes Gooch, and uh, she was just wonderful, and she did such an amazing job, and I got to talk to her. And then uh, a couple months later, I was working at Macy's, on Herald Square, the famous Macy's department store, their flagship store in New York City on Herald Square. And Miss Connell uh, came in again, and uh, she spoke with me at length again. Very nice woman. All of these celebrities, I can honestly say that I have had the opportunity to meet in the flesh. I'm going to tell you, there's a huge difference between how you perceive somebody, even somebody that you've seen on television or someone you've seen in the movies or someone you've read about in magazines or in newspaper articles. It is amazing how your perception of them changes when you see them in the flesh. A lot of people have said, I remember, uh, I could go down a list of so many celebrities I met or that I've seen. When I lived in New York City, I took advantage of the fact that <clears throat> I lived there. And there were a number of television shows that filmed in New York City at the time. Uh, back in the 90s, Joan Rivers had a morning talk show that she did. And I had the opportunity to attend and be in the audience at the Joan Rivers talk show on, good Lord, probably at least three or four times. Had the opportunity to see uh, uh, Sally Jesse Raphael. I, she was filming in New York City at the time. I had an opportunity to be in her audience on several occasions. I was not a huge fan, but I had the opportunity to sit in the audience of Geraldo Rivera's show on a number of occasions. 
uh, and I'm less of a fan today than I was then, but we won't go into that. And then uh, I also, again, not a huge fan, but I had the opportunity to be in the audience of the Montel Williams show on a number of occasions. I went to a Sally Jesse taping one time. I had tickets to go see Sally Jesse show. And uh, Joan Collins came up in a great big old limousine, you know, and they let her out and she's coming into the building and I'm standing not very, about as far from her as I am Rose right now. And Joan Collins come out of that limousine and I looked at her and I said, my God, I never knew Joan Collins was a little person. She's tiny. I mean, that woman is tiny. But having seen her on television and all, I never realized how petite and tiny she was. A lot of people would watch uh, Tammy Faye Baker on television, and they would never know that Tammy Faye Baker was less than five feet tall. She was a little, little, tiny, petite woman. But you know, what you see on television, what you see in the movies, what you perceive reading about somebody is not reality. Nothing brings you face to face with reality like an encounter in the flesh. Hallelujah. I want to tell you today, God revealed himself to humanity in the flesh, hallelujah, so that we could have a face-to-face -face encounter. And with that face-to-face -face encounter, we could have a revelation and an understanding of his person and of his personality and his character like nothing we had ever seen before. No one in the Old Testament had ever been able to experience God face to face. Especially, now a brief encounter is one thing, you know. I can say, for instance, yeah, I met Matthew Broderick. I knocked him on his rear end walking down West 4th Street, and I helped him up. But can I tell you anything at all about Matthew Broderick? Not a word. I can't tell you nothing except how tall he was and, you know, how big he was. That's all I can really tell you because I didn't have much of an encounter. But Jesus Christ was revealed to humanity, the physical manifestation of God, so that we could have a full and complete revelation of God in the flesh. He didn't just appear for a day and leave. He didn't just show up and disappear. No, this is why he came through the birth canal. This is why he came through uh, the manger. This is why he was born into the human experience. Not only did God want us to have a better understanding of himself, but he also wanted to have for himself, listen to me now, a better understanding of us. You know, there's an old saying, don't judge anybody until you've walked in their shoes for a while. Right. Well, God came and he revealed himself in the flesh for two purposes. One, so that we can understand him better, but two, so he could understand us better. That's why the word of God said, don't think for a moment that we have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He said, no, you've got to understand. The apostle Paul said, you've got to understand. <coughs> we have a high priest who understands our experience. Because this high priest, the only high priest that matters when it comes to salvation, this high priest has lived our life. <clears throat> He's been tempted. He's been tried. He's been tested. He knows what it's like to have the devil standing in front of you and trying to appeal to your fleshly nature. He understands what that's like. 
He went through that, didn't he? He had the devil standing there trying to tempt him with wealth and riches and trying to tempt him to step away from the plan of God and kind of take the easy route out because after all, Jesus knew good and well what was coming. And he knew it wasn't going to be pleasant. He knew it was going to be painful. He knew it was going to be hard. If he wasn't who he is, then he would not have known in advance, Tommy, everything that was coming down the pike. But he knew exactly what was coming. He stood there and told his disciples on several occasions, listen, I've got to die, but don't you worry, I'm going to rise again. He knew the whole time he was going to wind up dead. He knew that was part of the process. And when he'd say to his disciples, I'm going to die, honey, don't think for a minute he didn't know how that was going to transpire, that he didn't know exactly how that death was going to come. Wasn't going to be an easy death. Wasn't like he was going to get hit by a bus. Wasn't like he was going to get shot in the head. Wasn't like he was going to be beheaded. All of these things sound horrific, but you know what? Death is pretty quick. It's pretty instantaneous. No, he was going to go through a lengthy, lengthy, painful process. And he knew this. And the enemy stood there and tempted him and tried to appeal to that flesh nature that God himself had put on, thinking that perhaps even God could be tempted because of his having allowed himself to be revealed in human form. Maybe even God in human form could be tempted because after all, those of us that live this human experience know just how much influence our flesh has on our decision-making processes, don't we? Mm -hmm. We know, I won't tell you, it doesn't matter what's going on in your heart, it doesn't matter what's going on in your spirit, there are times when your flesh just wants to raise up and do some things that you know good and bloody well you ought to be doing. Some things cannot be done, Rose, by long distance. Some things cannot be done unless they are done in the flesh. There are times when a job requires that we physically get up and do that which is necessary. So it was with the work of salvation. God himself had to arise from his throne so that he could do the necessary work in the flesh. Of course, you've got to remember that God, not being a man, adds even, that this adds even greater significance to this term in the flesh as it applies to God. He did the work himself, but rather also that he went to enormous lengths in order to do that work himself mm -hmm. in the flesh. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 through 11 the word of God declares let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God Call it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's false doctrines and false teaching out there that will try to twist and pervert this passage, but you've got to understand something. Satan was cast out of heaven for thinking that he could be equal with God. Am I telling the truth? Right. So if Jesus was not to begin with God, that's why it says, who being in the form of God, as God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but, there's a but here, an important but, a big but, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. It doesn't say that the form of a servant was put upon him. It said he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness, in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Got news for you, honey. The name Jesus is exalted above the name Jehovah. It's a name that is exalted above every name. Hallelujah. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. You see, there are three places that spiritual beings exist. In heaven, we call them angels. On earth, we call them humans. Because you are a spiritual being wrapped in a flesh and blood experience. And under the earth, we call them demons. And the word of God said that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses tell you this means that Jesus Christ is Sir, that we call him Sir. No, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Deuteronomy tells us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In other words, there is only one Lord and there is only one God and they are one and the same. The same one you call God is the same one that you call Lord. There is no distinction between the two. And one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is indeed our Lord God. Colossians 2 verses 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness, all the fullness, all the fullness, hallelujah, all the fullness. That means there is nothing that is left out. All the fullness of what? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the flesh. All the fullness. The word Godhead that you read in the King James literally translates in the Greek all that pertains to God. So when you use the term Godhead, it is not talking about some divine holy trinity. That's not at all what it means. It, Godhead, the term Godhead simply means all that pertains to God. Everything that pertains to God. And he, Paul said... Don't let anybody spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit or the traditions of men after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of everything that pertains to God bodily in the flesh. Ooh, I'm going to tell you something. When you understand who Jesus is, when you understand that God himself made an in-the-flesh appearance, when you understand this, I'm going to tell you something. It'll blow your mind and it'll change your perception of God entirely. That's why I tell people, if you go to a church and they preach any God that looks different than Jesus, they are preaching a false God. Amen. See, when you read about this loving, compassionate, forgiving, gentle, kind, nonviolent, charitable, healing, delivering Jesus in the Word of God, guess what, folks? You're getting a snapshot. You're getting an image of God. 
And that is the correct image. That is the right image. Because that is the image that God himself wanted you to have. That is the image that God himself wanted you to see. Which is why he revealed himself in the flesh. Colossians 1, 14 through 21, the word of God declares. In whom, speaking of Jesus... We have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, listen, who is the image of the invisible God, who is the firstborn of every creature. You see, the word of God said in John chapter, you got to remember, everything has to be Word upon word, uh, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Keep things in context. John told us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God had an idea, He had a plan, He had a thought in the beginning. And that plan is what is referred to as word or logos, the term logos. Again, logos has nothing at all in the universe to do with a person. The term logos has nothing in the universe to do with a person. Logos literally means a plan or an idea that is uttered. So the Bible tells us in the beginning God uttered a plan. And that plan was with God in the beginning. God had this plan. This is not a plan that God dreamed up after he started creating, after everything came into existence. No. In the beginning, God had this plan, and that plan was with him in the beginning. Are you following me? And that plan was with God, and that plan was God. God was part of the plan from the beginning. Are you following me now? That's why the Word of God says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of every creature, meaning that nothing was created, not one single thing was created, except that Jesus Christ had already been spoken by God. That plan had already been uttered. He was already the center and the focus of the plan from the beginning. Are you following me now? Doesn't mean he was God's first creation. No, <laughs> he, he was the first creation in the sense that just like if I utter a word, I've created that word. I've created it. You know what I'm saying? But that's, that's as far as it goes. The plan was created and God was that plan and he was in that plan from the beginning. Now listen. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So he created them, Rose. Not only did he create them, but who did he create them for? He created them for himself. He did not create them for another person. This was not Michael the archangel creating for God. No, no. This is Jesus. The word of God said he all things were created that are in heaven. That would include Michael the archangel. When he talks about principalities or powers, do you recognize that phraseology anywhere? The word of God said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Do you follow me now? So you're talking about demonic powers, demonic principalities. And so therefore, the word of God tells us that Jesus created all these things. All these things, whether they be in heaven, whether they be in earth. So there wasn't even a, there was no angel in the beginning for God to refer to and for God to uh, turn into the, the Savior. No, 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 no. This is talking about the beginning, the very beginning. God 
all of these things were created. How were they created? They were created by God. Who was God? Jesus was God. Now listen. And he is before all things. And by all things. By him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the, the preeminence. Listen, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Didn't we just read a moment ago that in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him bodily? Well, now Paul said in Colossians, For it pleased the Father, the Creator, that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, by the man Jesus Christ, God reconciled all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, in the flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Listen to this last three-word phrase. In his sight. What does that mean? That means what Jesus did in the flesh, he did so that, listen to me now, this is super important. That God could see you this way. Now follow this. So that in his sight you could appear holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Everything Jesus Christ did on the cross was so that you could appear to God, oh, I hope you're understanding what I'm trying to convey today, so that you could appear to God as holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Well, I'm going to tell you, there are parents, they see their kid as just the greatest thing that ever walked. They see their child as being just the greatest kid. And the, oh, he's my kid is the best kid. I, I went to a funeral one time years ago in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'll never forget it. The pastor that I was working with had to preach a funeral for this young man. Uh, he was a young black man and he had a reputation for being a drug dealer and a pimp and all kind of horrible negative things. And this poor pastor that I was working with, he said, I don't, I don't even know how to go about doing this. He said, I'm praying and asking God, Lord, help me, because I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to go about it. He said, this kid had a reputation for doing every kind of wicked and evil thing on the planet. Finally, after a while, the pastor said to me, he said, you know what the Lord told me? The Lord told me funerals aren't for the dead, they're for the living. He said, so don't concentrate on the person in the coffin. Concentrate on the people who are still here. Try to be a comfort to them. Try to be an encouragement to them. Try to be a help to them. And that's the way that uh, Brother Brought approached the situation. But I remember being at that funeral, and the mother was sitting in a chair, rocking, just a screaming. He was such a good boy! He was such a good boy! And I sat there and I thought, what boy is she talking about? Surely not the one in the box, because... Everything I've heard about him was bad. Everything I heard about him was wicked. Everything I heard about Oh, but in her sight, are you following what I'm telling you today? In her sight, he was such a good boy. Got news for you. What Jesus did on the cross was not about changing you from who you are into somebody you're not. It was about changing God's perception 
of you. Because the minute that you come into a faith relationship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, God no longer views you the same way He viewed you before you were in relationship with Him. The minute He adopts you, the minute you come into His family by faith, God views you differently. Problem is, we got churches in our world today, fundamentalists and evangelical especially, who just love to preach the false message that even after you're saved, God still looks at you the same way He looks at the sinner on the street. They want to tell you that God still judges you by the same standard that He judges that person on the street who's never believed Him, who's never repented of their sins, who's never been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, who's never received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I've got news for you today, children. An LGBT person, you listen to me. You need to hear this. You need to get this down in your head today. That is false teaching. The minute you're adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, God sees you differently. Now, does that mean you can just do anything you want to do? Does that mean you can live an ungodly life? No, because if you approach things from that perspective, listen to me now. If you approach things from the perspective of, well, grace covers everything, so I can just do anything and everything I want to do and do it the way I want to do it, and God will accept me. God's okay with me. The minute you do that, what you're doing is you're nullifying your faith by behaving like an unbeliever. Because an unbeliever believes that there is no repercussions for their evil and their wickedness, and they can do whatever they want to do, and they're going to get away with it. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And this is why it's imperative that believers, we live differently, we act differently, we do our best with what we've got. Not to earn heaven, not to avoid hell, but we do it because we understand that God has extended his grace to us, but by the same token, we nullify that grace when we take it for granted. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So by no means do I want anybody leaving this place or leaving this broadcast and saying, See, Pastor Charles said I can go out and whore it up. I can sleep with everything that comes down the street. I can drink drunk every night. I can do drugs. I can play games. I can do all these things. And God's okay with me. No. If you're going to be a believer, if you're going to believe God is real, if you're going to believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary for you, then God expects your life to reflect that faith. Am I telling the truth today? Mm, uh -huh. But when we come into relationship with God, the Word of God said that through His flesh, in the body of His flesh, in the flesh, Jesus Christ, through death presents us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Hallelujah. Isn't that a wonderful truth to understand today? Mm -hmm. 1 Timothy 3.16, the Word of God declares, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now the term godliness here is the same term as we read uh, when we read the word Godhead, meaning great is the mystery of all that pertains to God. Then Paul continues in his letter to Timothy and said, God was manifest in the flesh. Man, you can't get very much clearer than that. But listen, he said, justified in the spirit. See, Jesus Christ was not justified by reason of the fact that everything he did in the flesh, he did perfect and right. That was not the standard. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, man looks after the outward appearance, but God looks where? God looks on the heart. Jesus Christ was justified 
in the spirit. Well, how, how, what is that? What does that mean? It means something very simple because there wasn't a man on the planet who could be justified in his spirit. There was not a man on this planet that had a perfect heart, that had a perfect spirit, that everything internally was perfect. But Jesus Christ had only one spirit in him, and that spirit was who? The spirit of God. And for that reason, he was perfect, and he was justified in the spirit. There was nothing at all out of place in his spirit because his spirit was that of God alone. The word of God continues, 1 Timothy 3, 16. He was a manifest, God was manifest in the flesh, not the Son of God. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. You got to understand the word of God tells us God is not a man. The word of God tells us God is a spirit. The Word of God tells us that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So the angels, for the first time in eternity, had an in-the-flesh image of God. Even the angels, <laughs> for the first time, oh, hallelujah! Do you understand? I'm, I'm getting chills all the way down my backbone right now. i got... Goosebumps on the back of my bottom. Hallelujah. Even the angels now could see God in a way and in a perspective that they had never seen God before. Do you follow what I'm telling you? God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. Jesus Christ justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. And received up into glory. Hallelujah. Now you're going to tell me 1 Timothy 3.16 was talking about anybody but Jesus Christ. Of course it was talking about Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3 verses 15 through 20. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that, whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing, than for evil doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water in the flesh. You see, God could not do what needed to be done unless he did it in the flesh. There was no other way to accomplish salvation. There was no other way to accomplish redemption without God himself taking on human form. It could not be anyone else. No one else could possibly have done the job because the job required that the heart and the spirit within the man be so pure and so holy and so righteous that it literally was the mirror image of God himself. You remember what image Adam was created in? In the very image and likeness of who? God. Jesus is called what? The second Adam. That spirit within him had to be 
divine. It had to be perfect. It had to be absolute God in order for what he was doing in the flesh to accomplish the task. Anything short of that combination would not have worked. 1 Peter 4 and verses 1 and 2, almost done today. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. So Jesus suffered in the flesh so that we could have an opportunity to no longer live our lives according to the flesh, but rather we could live our lives according to what? The will of God. That's why I said, don't you go out of here telling people, oh, Pastor Charles said I can do whatever I want to do and everything's good and God's okay with everything. Listen, there are a lot of churches in the LGBT community, folks, that are permissive and they preach a false notion of grace. They go to an extreme. It's what I refer to as hyper-liberal. They try to preach that, you know, God is so merciful and kind and His grace is so big that no matter what you believe, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, all is well with the world. No, that is not how it works. Our behavior is to change after we come into relationship with God. But it is not about earning heaven. It is not about avoiding hell. It is about reflecting that relationship. You know, I remember when I was a kid, there was a movie on, te on television that was called The Prince and the Pauper. You remember The Prince and the Pauper? There was a prince, a young man, just a kid, and it just so happened there was a pauper on the street, a poor kid on the street that looked just identical to the prince. And the prince happened upon him and said, Oh, hey, I, get, I can actually live like a regular person for a little while. But if I live like a regular person, then you're going to have to live like me. You're going to have to act like the prince while I'm acting like you out on the street. So they switched roles for a few. And that kid who went into the castle, that kid who went into the uh, royal household, had an awful hard time because he wasn't familiar with all the uh, protocols. He wasn't familiar with how everything was supposed to be done in a royal household. But he had to learn, didn't he? Because he'd have given away everything if, if he had not changed his conduct and his behavior. Of course, the prince, trying to act like a pauper, he stood out like a sore thumb because he didn't understand how kids on the street acted either. Am I telling the truth now? But see, the problem is, when you become a child of God, you're no longer a pauper, now you're a prince, and you got to learn to behave like a prince. That's right. Doesn't mean daddy's going to love you less because you ain't acting right. Hello now. But your heart and your mind has to be committed. The Bible said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. That doesn't mean, it doesn't say walk in holiness or you will not see God. That is not what it says. It says follow holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness. In other words, pursue holiness. So our goal and our aim in life as a child of God ought to be, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like the Lord. I know sometimes, especially when I write things about a certain Donald Trump, I know that their stuff comes out of my mouth and I'll say, well, God, forgive me. I, I know this probably isn't very Christ-like. This isn't very Christian. Lord, help me to one day, I won't feel this way. Help me to one day not, you know, not even be motivated or, or think about writing such words as this. But that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> I can be a hypocrite. I can try to act like that's not where I'm at, but I'm going to stand here and tell you the truth. That's where I'm at right now. You follow what I'm telling you? But in my spirit and in my heart, I lust after or I desire better things. I desire to be more like Jesus. Hallelujah. The Word of God tells us today in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Beloved, believe not every spirit 
but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know we the spirit, uh, know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. There are a lot of people that will try to tell you that John was saying simply that uh, anybody that tells you that the man Jesus Christ didn't live, that is not what John said. It's not even close to what John said. He said, if any man tell you that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh. Well, come in the flesh, first of all, that implies that he started somewhere that was not flesh. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. And that he then came to the earth in the flesh. It's not talking about any man that says Jesus Christ wasn't born, that he wasn't, he didn't live. No, that's not. John was the number one disciple preaching the divinity of Jesus Christ. None of the Lord's apostles understood his divinity like John. If you read every single book written by John, the focus, ask any theologian, I don't care if they're Roman Catholic, I don't care if they're Episcopalian, I don't care if they're Pentecostal, or if they're Baptist, ask any theologian and they will tell you, the emphasis of John's writing was the divinity of Jesus Christ. Christ. So what John is saying here is anyone who denies the divinity, the divine origin of Jesus Christ, anyone who does not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, he said that is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist does not want to deny that Jesus Christ was a man. No. The spirit of Antichrist doesn't have a problem with the belief that Jesus Christ was simply a man. The spirit of Antichrist doesn't have a problem with the idea that Jesus Christ was a prophet. The spirit of Antichrist doesn't have a problem with the idea that Jesus Christ was a good man or a philosopher. None of those things offend the spirit of Antichrist. No, why would the spirit of Antichrist have a problem with the notion that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh? Well, if you know anything about the Antichrist, it's because that will be his claim. Therefore, if he is to be that, then Jesus Christ cannot be that. If the Antichrist will claim to be God manifest in the flesh, then, the anti then this Christ cannot be God meant. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? And he said, anyone who denies that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh... Is that is the spirit of Antichrist? Oh, I'm gonna tell you, folks. The Mormons, that is the spirit of Antichrist. The Jehovah's Witnesses, that is the spirit of Antichrist. These religions are operating and functioning under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist. Lastly, I want to close right now. For many, John said in 2 John 1 and 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. In the flesh, there are some things that can't be done any other way. They can't be done long distance. They can't be done by docu-sign. They can't be done by email. They can't be done by letter. They must be done in the flesh. Mm -hmm.